It's 5.02. And Chris, you uh, want to mm. want to submit a um, site plan review request? Um, so yeah, I guess we've got um, three things that I had been in contact with um, Don late last week and yesterday. Um, we have some follow-up information for that amended site plan on Mustang Wheatley that we wanted to just share with you. Um, I think that was a minor thing. Um, um, I am uh, happy to kind of uh, walk through the, the plan that we submitted um, with the changes that we're requesting for Seven River Road. Um, and then we also have um, a site plan review application for, for um, a new project um, at Three River Road adjacent to Seven River Road. We, we scheduled Peggy and Kimberly for the first item on the agenda. Yeah, I told Chris if he popped in just to let us know what was going on. You are going to have somebody um, back later or further on in the meeting that can uh, address any questions that we would yeah. have. Absolutely. I'm on for now. Um, and then Chris Schufler from our office is going to be here to, to display some plans. And then I was also planning to log back in um, a little later on when we revisit those those items. Okay. Um, but obviously I'm I am um, on your agenda uh, in terms of when when to go. Yeah, you're, you're under other. So we do have a, a, a agenda to follow. So uh, we are going to go ahead and let uh, Peggy Sloan take the uh, command. Okay, I'm here with Kimberly McPhee, um, and we developed a draft um, bylaw for you to consider, um, a draft floodplain overlay district bylaw. So hopefully you all have a copy of that. I can do a share screen if you'd like, but sometimes that gets a little difficult. So let me know what your preference would be, Tom and Judy. Does everybody have a copy? I have a copy. Yeah. Firm. I'm looking at a document in our shared folder that says preliminary draft 4821, April 8th, 21. Is that the one you're referring to, Peggy? I believe so. Okay. Um, so basically the approach that we took is we took the model bylaw from the state and I pretty much stuck with that. Um, areas that were highlighted in yellow are either um, things that we need to spay pay special attention to, or you need to pay special attention to, or things that need um, filling in. Uh, the two things that I, I really need feedback from you uh, tonight on are one, um, who might be the flood pain administrator? Um, and two, what the permit or review process would be uh, for a new development in the floodplain. Um, this, State model bylaw basically left it up to the towns to try and figure that out. Um, so what's your preference, Don? Do you want me to go through section by section? Um, or do you want to just focus on some of the key areas? Brian, what's the title of the document you're looking at in the share drive? So um, you'd first look under board projects. So just uh, that's where we kind of have all of the things that are not related to particular meetings or addresses. Floodplain, right? And then under floodplain, and then there's a word document that says floodplain bylaw preliminary draft. Gotcha. You. Thank you. And I just pulled it up on the screen just so if that's easier, people can see. So the, the first section, I also formatted the bylaw so it would fit into your existing zoning bylaws. Um, so your current section is 171-26. Um, this starts out with a purpose section, uh, basically um, use the different uh, purpose um, elements that were um, provided by the state. Uh, once again, the state is looking to review these and sign off on them uh, to make sure that um, towns have updated bylaws so that they can participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. 
The next section deals with the floodplain district. Um, Kimberly had provided information on the firm maps and also the national flood insurance program study that was completed. So uh, that was added. Um, just in terms of general information, it makes it clear that these regulations um, will take precedence over or add additional regulations um, uh, for any less restrictive conflicting local laws. So um, these need to be followed. The next section D is designation of a community floodplain administrator. Last time we had talked about there might be some potential for an assistant planner or planning position in Waitley. And I don't know what the status of that is. I, I have some input on that, Peggy. The, yes. I talked to Brian last week and he is quite sure that, or he, he expects that this is in the budget. He expects it, he has support of the finance committee. It will be, uh, I think the title, title is still up in the air, but something like uh, assistant town administrator and 50% okay. of the time will be land use issues. And he's quite happy to have that be the designated administrator, that person. And when, when does that go to town meeting? It will go on the 15th. May 15th? June. 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 Okay. All right. So um, the other area that I highlighted was just under number two. This is actually language from the state model bylaw. And it says, that this person's responsibility is ensuring that permits are applied for when development of any kind is proposed in the floodplain overlay district. And I sort of struggled with that phrase because that's a lot of responsibility to put <laughs> on an individual um, that they should ensure that permits are applied for. Uh, so if folks have, um, other suggestions about maybe tweaking that word. Um, I was a little uncomfortable with that. <laughs> um, I kind of like it. And one of the things that I've started doing is uh, every Friday, I, I take a look and see what uh, new permits have been uh, applied for. So I'm just and then checking out what the uh, description is. And uh, the other thing that's I've been doing is working on updating the new uh, town map with, with uh, the assessors using the assessors uh, information and I found out that uh, we can add a, um, a shape file which will have all of the uh, floodplain information in there so you can turn that uh, floodplain off and on which makes it a lot easier to see where we're going. And that can be added to um, our assessor's map as well as the zoning. So, uh, and that's a free thing. All we have to do is su supply it to the people who uh, maintain the G mass GIS map. So that's a couple of things that are in the, in the works for the near future. All right, so it sounds like insuring is okay, so I can. Well, I was that. wondering, I think that this is going to involve a lot more than just the typical building permits. And I'm wondering if maybe something like overseeing the permit application process. Is that strong? That's maybe not strong enough. Well, I think the next step would be to send this, um, you know, a, the second draft or once yeah, the planning board feels that, like this is in good shape to MEMA to have them review it and hopefully give their uh, blessing <laughs> of the bylaw before the town took it to a public hearing and town meeting and, and all of that. So I think we can try overseeing the, and we need to discuss whether it's a permit process or one of the things that um, 
Joy from NEMA said she's the person that looks over the, the model or the bylaws that the towns um, develop and, and gives feedback on was that it, it was more of a, re it could also be considered a review process um, as opposed to a permit process. Um, and, and this is an area where we need to have some discussion, but I'll just save that for a minute um, and flag that. So we'll either be overseeing the permit process or overseeing the review process. Um, Cause I had a suggestion uh, that I wanted the planning board to consider. Um, the next sections is variance to building code floodplain standards. And I confirm with Jim Hawkins um, that that only can be done by the state. So that was the option um, that I chose. I guess there's some towns that have the ability to do building code variances, but Waitley is not one of them. Um, the variance to local zoning bylaws, I just added in there um, uh, the actual zoning bylaws for Waitley. Um, that deal with variances so that those were easily referenced by your floodplain bylaw. And then here's G, permit required for all proposed development in the floodplain overlay district. The, the town of Waitley requires a permit for all proposed construction. And so this is where the town has to decide what type of permit they would like to require beyond a building permit. So mm -hmm. I know some towns have kind of a streamlined permit, special permit or permit process for certain things, but you're basically creating another process. And I was wondering if maybe site plan review made more sense um, for two reasons. One, you already have that in place. Um, I assume, I expect that the building inspector is the enforcement officer for your site plan review decisions because the state wants to know what the enforcement process is if somebody violates this. And it also seemed like site plan review uh, process would be better, particularly for exempt uses like agricultural buildings and things of that nature, which um, now NEMA is saying need, need to be reviewed. So I'd like your feedback on that suggestion or whether you want to use a special permit process or come up with a different permit process <laughs> to be determined. Is there any indication of what other towns are doing? No, not at this point. You're one of the first. So I think you design it in a way mm -hmm. that it works for Waitley and then hopefully we get Mima's sign off. I've been reading these articles about Hadley and the difficulties they're having with camping permits. And that seems to go through the Conservation Commission. And it's a land disturbance issue and it goes to the Conservation Commission. So it's, I guess, one question is whether they're all going through the planning board or, you know, some of these things seem more relevant to, to other boards in town. Yeah, well, I would, I would think that if we did it with a, a, a site plan review, that it would be built into the site plan review for um, the overlay district that the Conservation Commission be involved. Does that make sense to you, Judy? I was trying to duck it, Don. You're not helping. <laughs> well, it makes it, it makes a lot of sense, but it's you know what you're talking about site plan review for a lot of things that are, are well beyond the scope of anything we're looking at now. Yes, I know. Well, maybe we should talk to um, the Conservation Commission and see what their feeling is. Well, Ann Barker's here. Yeah, I'm here. I, 
It makes sense for the CONCOM to be involved. It's just a question of when they get involved. Um, you know, I have no, I don't think anyone would have an issue with our involvement or seeing permits, et cetera, but um, I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure we're the first ones to see the, should see the permit. That's just my sort of first reaction to it or have site plan review or. Don, would it make sense for you to sit down with, with Brian and Scott or a representative from the Conservation Commission and kind of talk this through? I think so. We're, we're working on a fairly flexible time frame here, I think, aren't we, Peggy? Yes, we are. Um, when Joy came to present, she basically said we had more time than we had expected. Um, so yes, you have more time um, to figure this out. And there may be, you know, other towns that um, go further along. I just, I didn't think it was good to create like a third type of permit process or a different type of permit process. I'm always one that would rather stick with what the boards are already doing if possible so that yeah. you don't have confusing timelines or criteria differences and things of that nature. Um, and so if the CONCOM for, you know, was the lead, then we'd have to figure out how to specify that in the zoning bylaws and then the conservation commission would have to decide what the permit process would be or the review process would be for areas outside of um, wetland areas that are normally their jurisdiction. So it seemed that the floodplain bylaw was dealing likely with you know, like residential structures or other things, other types of land uses that would typically come before the planning board. If you look at this list, you know, construction or changes to existing buildings, placement of manufactured homes, ag facilities is new to everybody, or may maybe the CONCOM reviews some of that for wetlands, um, but ag facilities have exemption from zoning, um, so. Yeah, well, as I look at it, placement of manufactured homes, we probably wouldn't see unless it was an accessory unit. Um, yeah. Placement of agricultural facilities, we wouldn't see. Wouldn't see, yeah. Fences, sheds, storage facilities, we wouldn't see. Right. Um, so. Yes, this will add a significant amount if there are proposals to locate in the floodplain. Hopefully most people would not want to put their structures in the floodplain. <laughs> yeah. Now the building inspector knows to check with the conservation commission anytime that there's a, a um, wetland issue. I suppose a process that involves a floodplain issue would work the same way, but of course you're not always going through the building inspector, which is where it all falls apart. Yeah. I, I think too, if um, we want to investigate having the Conservation Commission take a, a higher profile role potentially in issuing the permit, it would be through I would imagine it would have to be through the order of conditions, but it might be interesting to contact the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions and see if they have, if they know of towns who, whose conservation commissions have been more actively involved in the uh, regulation of the 100 year floodplain, because if you read the legislation, it's actually a resource area that um, is called out and kind of under under their jurisdiction. But I, you know, 
I think that there are some subtleties that we might need to get some feedback, not only from the Whaley Conservation Commission, but maybe town council and um, MACC. So we make sure that we understand what the Conservation Commission could actually help with and how that might expand the, the duties that they, they already have. Hmm. That makes well, sense. Probably the, the discussion um, with Brian and, and Scott and maybe even bring Roger in on it, um, just to kind of toss around what How, how we want to approach the whole permit piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll leave that one for now until. Uh, um, and the other thing I can do too is contact uh, Joy at the state and ask her if she has, uh, if she knows of any communities who have used the Conservation Commission as the as the lead on this or conservation commissions that have a significant role and see if we can get some examples. They might well, we be. did ask her if we sent the responses from Joy and one of our questions was, does MEMA have an example of a permit process adopted by another town for potential development in the floodplain? And the answer that came back, MEMA would not be an appropriate agency to deal with local permitting processes in general. <laughs> okay. Since this question is fairly vague, perhaps you can be more specific when we talk on the 14th. I would need to understand more clearly what the actual issue is here. <laughs> well, right. that's what we're trying to, you know. <laughs> so I, I guess it would be fine to ask her, you know, are, do you, does she know of other towns that, you know, the Conservation Commission is the lead in overseeing it, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, we would need to be very clear in the zoning bylaws that the Conservation Commission um, would be the, the permitting entity and um, would they use the, the regular wetlands permitting process or would, would that be adjusted? I, I don't know, I'm not a wetlands permitting <laughs> person so I don't um, have experience in that area. Do you do you two ever use send out questions on the planners list, sir? Yes, we do. But we we were hoping that MEMA could provide some feedback since yeah. this is their mo model bylaw. No, I understand um, that. And this is this is Chris again. I just uh, this is something that we deal with a lot. So I can give you just some general information on work in the floodplain related to the Conservation Commission. Um, so the 100-year floodplain, which is defined as all areas below the 100-year flood elevation, which may or may not be the same as what the map says, is a resource area under the Wetlands Protection Act. And so in general, any project that's going to disturb land within that floodplain is supposed to get an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. Um, but the standard is pretty straightforward. It's simply um, preserving the same amount of flood storage that exists today. So within any one foot band between say elevation 100 and 101, we would have to show that any uh, creation of fill, be it buildings or earth or whatever, is offset by cut somewhere else so that the volume of a sort of, the, the volume that can be filled by flood water uh, when it comes is not reduced. We can increase it, we just can't reduce it. So Thanks. you're saying this, this isn't all that different? Um, yeah, I, I wasn't quite uh, listening very closely about what the stand, proposed standard is, um, but uh, it does sound like it's, it's similar um, to what the, what the state regulations require the Conservation Commission to do. Okay, so it sounds maybe this is heading towards the Conservation Commission. 
<laughs> but Don, why don't you have uh, a follow-up meeting to discuss that in more detail and maybe you can share the, the draft bylaw with them. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, then this is the, the next section is other necessary um, permits. So the whoever is doing the permit review process um, needs to have a checklist of uh, all the local, state, and federal permits that will be necessary in order to receive approval from the proposed development in the floodplain overlay district. Um, that's their suggestion for subdivision proposals. Um, I did add the language that's in yellow in one, um, that such proposals is these are um, typically residential subdivisions, but I guess you could also have commercial, but such proposals minimize flood damage and to the maximum extent feasible, locate all structures, roads, utilities, and other infrastructure out of the floodplain overlay district. Um, it may seem like that's um, adding similar language to two, but two is specifically referencing public utilities and facilities. So I was, some towns, uh, you know, have private roads and subdivisions, and um, there may be um, other utilities um, that fall outside of public utilities. So it just seems good to add that to encourage folks not to put things in the floodplain. Sounds good. Uh, base flood elevation data. It's just asking. Um, what the tech for the technical data. Uh, this is also directly from the state's model bylaw. Um, and this is uh, talking about unnumbered A zones and the building inspector needs to obtain review and reasonably utilize base flood elevation and floodway data. Um, so Floodway enroachment is just the same as the model bylaw, by and then water course alterations here again. Uh, whoever turns out to be the floodplain administrator, um, we just need to presumably say who that is so it's, it's clear in this section. And then finally, local enforcement. They didn't give a sample text. They just said, please read the explanation in section four about the importance of being able to point to specific local enforcement procedures for non-compliant floodplain development. So presumably if this was in the Conservation Commission's uh, purview, it would be whatever their enforcement procedures are. Uh, if it ended up being in the Planning Board's purview, presumably it would be the building inspector uh, enforcing the conditions, for example, of the site plan but this gets back to figuring out what the local permit process is gonna be and therefore what the enforcement procedures are gonna be. And finally, we have a bunch of definitions <laughs> um, that we need to add into the zoning um, that currently aren't there. And I'm not gonna read all of them. There was one that I asked for clarification from Mima on, um, they had language that I didn't find very clear about the start of construction. And this relates to you know, what map you use. And I imagine it also relates as if you have a floodplain claim that this definition. Um, so I, it was the date, the language was the date of issuance for new construction. And I asked them what date of issuance of what, and it's a, of a building permit. So I uh, added that. Um, and I also tried to clarify that the actual start of construction means the date of the first placement of permanent construction. So those were just clarifications I got from the state because I didn't find that definition uh, as clear as it could be. We just need to cross-reference this new structure definition with Waitley's structure definition and maybe collapse the two or I'm not quite sure how we do that. Um, so I'm just flagging that. Uh, maybe they're consistent and we can just add this language into the current structure definition. And then there's all the definition of the different flood zones that are on your current map. 
Um, so that's it. It uh, turned out to be about eight pages of, nine pages of new zoning bylaw. Well, the paper industry will be happy. Either that or Adobe Acrobat. <laughs> so I'm going to stop I'm sharing. Good. Is there any place where I can access this remotely from home? Or if, can I get a copy through the town so I can peruse it at my leisure? I'll, I'll send you a copy, Rich. Thank you. I, sorry, I thought it was up there, but I guess it's not. <coughs> okay, so I guess the to-do list is for Don to meet with the Conservation Commission and uh, Brian to figure out the permit process and let me know that so I can add that into um, the zoning bylaws and then once town meeting occurs uh, we'll have confirmation of who the floodplain administrator is um, and if there are any other changes um, that people want to suggest if they could just email me um, but hopefully it's in pretty good shape to once we fill in those gaps uh, to send it off to the state and hopefully get their feedback um, that they're happy with it. And then presumably you want town council to review it before you went through the public hearing process. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kimberly and, and Peggy. Uh, Great. You can't lap. Any other questions before we head out? <laughs> it's town meeting season. You probably need to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All right. Thanks for having us. We'll uh, wait to hear from you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Bye. Hmm. Okay. Continuation of... Uh, We can't do that till six. Okay. Excuse me, this is Mary. I'm here. Uh, I've been taking some notes. I came in like at letter E, I think. Um, this is not, is this available on the uh, OneDrive? The, this under the projects, under floodplain. Okay. I just, and then the, the um, there. graph from four, eight or something. So. Okay. Well, um, Chris, do you have something you can you can share that we can chat about at this point? Um, most definitely. Um, so I think um, the first thing, which uh, is a list on the agenda, which I, I believe you folks were talking about at the last meeting, was the uh, Mustang Waitley project. Um, I can pull up a site plan if it's helpful, um, but I think um, just briefly, um, we had submitted plan updates um, a little while back, I'm not sure when exactly, um, showing uh, the sort of rearrangement of the site and uh, expansion of the headhouse portion of that project at the midpoint of the greenhouse. Um, if you recall, over a year, pre-COVID, pre I know for sure, um, I had come and sort of previewed some of those details, but the planning board wanted to see the, the final plan when it was set, um, and now it is, and so that's what we've submitted. Um, my understanding was the, the primary question uh, after reviewing the plan was about the, um, the existing mechanical room at the north end of the site, um, closest to Christian Lane, closest to the abutters, and what was going on there. Um, and so I'd sent Don a written answer, um, but briefly in the existing condition, that little room that's uh, near the entrance to the site on Christian Lane currently houses boilers and electrical panels. Um, originally, the intention was to continue to have that sort of equipment in that room um, and expand it, but instead um, it makes a whole lot more sense uh, for the project, both the way it's being phased in the interior work and with the site in general, to move all of the mechanical equipment to the head house in the middle of the site. Um, and so that room then becomes just storage for growing media like uh, coconut 
pads and uh, soils and that sort of thing and trays. Um, so there is no noise making equipment of any kind there. I know, I understand that was one of the concerns. Um, and then also I forwarded today um, to Don some email exchange that we had with Mark Boussier, who's the um, abutter closest to the site, to all of these changes, to that room in particular. Um, we had provided a full copy of these plans to the Boussiers uh, back in March. Um, and the email that I forwarded, uh, he had responded, didn't have any concerns, and incidentally is interested in being our electrical contractor on the project. So, so certainly <laughs> um, no concerns with the project. So this is the, uh, the plan that's been updated. Oh, good. Um, you were these these um, were the mechanical so rooms? That actually there. looks like the... Yeah, so that is actually the 2020 plan. That's the one I presented when, when I was last in person. I, I have it up if, if I'm... If I have the power to share my screen, um, I can show you, but it should be the 2021. Um, okay. It looks like you did have it open there, but. Um, so I've un case, unshared, me... so you could go ahead and share. Sure. Um, so this is the uh, plan that we had submitted in March. Um, and also I apologize, I, I have a, not a great connection here. So if any of this is choppy, that's uh, entirely my fault right now. Um, but again, so in that portion of the site at the Northern Mechanical Room, we're actually proposing no work anymore um, because it just doesn't really make sense with the flow of the project. Um, but in order to avoid having to do some significant reconstruction of some of the structural components inside the building, um, what we've proposed is to pull some of what we're calling the, the headhouse space um, out to the rear of the building. So State Road is over on your left here uh, to give you orientation. Um, and then, you know, in the spirit of the zoning bylaw about the limit on buildings uh, for marijuana establishments, we have kept the, the timber frame portion of this building below the 4,000 square feet. Um, and then we are also demolishing a portion of the existing rainwater capture room and rearranging and creating new greenhouse space um, for some of that uh, space that doesn't truly need to be within a building. Um, and we're also um, eliminating the existing propane storage that I think everybody's familiar with on the state road side of the site and moving that behind the building and closer to a lot of that mechanical space that'll work. We're also pulling septic system, basically, all the improvements now and uh, to the site as well as some of the existing features of the site are moved to the rear um, behind the building. And then something that was not reflected on our original plans but was requested as part of the HCA process is that we've proposed a bunch of screening, a mix of river birch and I think it's uh, spruce trees uh, along Route 5 to try to soften the impact of this very long um, open uh, and sometimes very bright uh, uh, face of the greenhouse. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, substantially the same uh, for the most part, we're reusing uh, this very large greenhouse structure for cannabis cultivation. And we have, uh, you know, improvements of the gravel roadway uh, circulating the site. Um, and basically everything else uh, stays as is. Chris? Yes. When you write, I thought this was actually not going to be purple at all anymore and have panels on the inside. So what do you mean by bright? bright. Oh, I, right. I didn't mean bright by lights at night. I meant that when you drive down during the daytime, it's it's uh, sort of shining and, and this single 600 foot long wall. Um, we okay. are changing that material, if you'll recall, to the insulated panel, which will block the light. Um, you know, we don't anticipate it's gonna be any any brighter in the daytime than it is now, um, but certainly adding that screening um, and those are scheduled to go in. As on my previous projects at a, at a 10 foot height, substantial plants um, and given the angle of everything, it's actually gonna break things up quite a lot from the street. Thank you. Okay, this plan and I guess, I don't remember if this was on the plan also, but the Boussiers had also requested some screening. So we also have a row of evergreens um, along the property line at the top, just to create more buffer there, especially from the sort of back of house area that we have. 
And you're not planning on step. scroll up a little bit. You're not planning on taking any of the vegetation along Christian Lane out, out are you? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, essentially, uh, there's going to be very little change to the outside. There is going to be a gate across the um, existing entrance. Um, and otherwise, this is all protected buffer area. Um, so we would even have to go back to Conservation Commission if we were uh, to propose any of that. And the barns are coming down. The barns are coming down, um, and unfortunately. We actually, the, the contractor explored cost-effective ways of reusing them, but at the same time, um, it really was generated from the comment from the fire department that if either of them ever caught fire, it would really threaten the greenhouse. Um, and, and despite the fact that the fire station is across the street, they told us in no uncertain terms that they would not be able to put that blaze out um, before it, it caused damage. Um, so they have engaged with an architectural salvage company um, that's going to, you know, dismantle the barns. My, my understanding is um, that they use it for store displays uh, and I imagine for, for true architectural uses as well, but um, I think that's still uh, not 100% certain. Well, I would entertain a motion to accept the final plan. I'll second if there are no more questions. Okay, since I, I will rephrase that. I will move that we accept the final plan. Do I have a, I have a second? So Judy, you, you, will you officially second? Yeah, okay. but I don't know if other people had questions. Well then now, like now is when we discuss. Is there any yeah. discussion? I think the plan's improved. Yeah. yeah. It looks good to me. Actually, just as a tangential question, since I saw that it, uh, the plan mentions the 100 year floodplain zone within the limits of the property, would this have fallen under the new floodplain bylaw if it were in effect? Because there's a bit of, of the property that's in that zone? in that overlay district. Not relevant to the to the voting to approve. It was just something I observed in the upper left corner of the plan. I would think only if there's just something new going on there. Anyway. Um, Is think, that up in, in the area where the solar panels are, Brent? Um, um, I was no, it's, it's associated with that. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, it's it's associated with the with the stream that runs on the extreme northwestern corner of the site, right near the Christian Lane Route Five um, intersection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm good with this. Okay, I'm going to do a roll call vote then. Sarah. Aye. Don. Yes. Brant. Yes. Judy. Yes. And Tom. Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. And we still have 15 minutes. You want to uh, get started on the, well, let's, why don't we do seven um, Great. River Road? Is that okay, Chris? Absolutely. Um, and I have that pulled up here. Um, let me share that. Um, okay, so um, on Seven River Road, um, we uh, submitted a plan last week um, to up uh, as an update to our approved site plan that, that we're requesting uh, approval as an amendment. What I'm showing you here is the original site plan. And what I wanna highlight is um, in the original plan, we had proposed these 12 individual, sort of what we call Gothic style greenhouses, as well as these three uh, greenhouse structures, um, but housing um, support material, uh, support areas for our maintenance, our uh, drying of the cannabis plants, uh, nursery and, and general storage. And um, in the new plan, which I'll explain in a moment, but show first, 
Um, the change is that uh, within the same footprint, actually just a very slightly smaller overall footprint, um, we are uh, proposing to instead do, um, instead of the 12 grow greenhouses, to do two gutter connected greenhouses. Um, as I said, the overall area dedicated to greenhouse is slightly smaller. This 210 dimension had been 220. Um, the area under roof, I'll call it, increases a little bit. Um, the total area under roof had been 45,000 square feet. It would now come up to 50,000 square feet. Doesn't change any of our zoning calculations. The, um, the area that is now under roof had been compacted gravel and we were counting it as coverage anyway. And you know the, the reason for this change is that we had proposed the separate greenhouse structures um, under the understanding that those structures would come at a significant cost savings. And what it has turned out is that it's true that the structures themselves cost quite a bit less, but there are a number of hidden infrastructure costs that uh, as we run into has more than offset any potential savings. Um, and those include more electrical runs, more plumbing, more equipment, more footings um, uh, within the interior of the site. Um, and so that has led to uh, this proposal um, to do these as two sets of gutter connected greenhouses. Um, in general, the characteristics remain the same. These are still transparent structures, um, uh, both up and to the sides with polycarbonate roofs and walls. We still have gravel um, surfacing on the inside. So we're still respecting that zoning definition of what a greenhouse is. Uh, they still have the same high powered carbon uh, filters for odor. Uh, control. Um, there's a slight difference in height. These gutter connects uh, at the peak are now 17 feet versus 15 feet at the peak of the separate greenhouses. Um, by comparison, I believe uh, the, the Mustang Waitley uh, greenhouse is 14 feet to the uh, to the girders, the peaks being higher than that. So um, in both cases, these structures are shorter than what you see over there. And then, you know, the other thing is in recognition that uh, the zoning bylaw has that uh, requirement for, uh, you know, rainwater harvest uh, as possible. Um, it was not possible under the scheme where we had individual greenhouses just because the style of those greenhouses did not lead to a uh, very easy uh, capture of rain. Um, in this case, now that we have the gutter connects, we do have discrete points where we can capture rainwater harvest. So we've also incorporated about 10,000 gallons of rainwater storage to help offset some of the irrigation water, which itself is, is being sourced um, on site from a well. Um, and so other than that, uh, this uh, should be um, exactly the same as the plan that we, as our final stamp plan that we had submitted um, after approval as a record um, inclusive of, of that survey that we had submitted as one of our conditions. Um, so with that, that's uh, to discuss the changes. And again, we're, we're uh, requesting that this be um, uh, uh, considered an uh, amended site plan and happy to answer any questions or if there's any other information or procedures that the board feels are necessary to approve it. Are there any questions? Oh. So I do, oh, so I do have the, you, you've, you've stated, Chris, that the odor control systems are the same. And I just, I guess I'd just like to hear that, maybe hear you elaborate on that a little bit. Because you know my vision was, you know, twelve smaller buildings versus two much larger buildings might have different fan arrangements and might create other design questions around odor mitigation, and perhaps not. So I just really wanted to probe that a little bit further. Um, and I will start an answer, but um, I know Jared Glansberger is on. He's been more, uh, he's uh, with DMT CTC, the owner, um, and he's been more involved in um, sort of what's going on in the interior of the greenhouses. Um, but, you know, the, the key uh, sort of big picture thing to remember is that the way that the ventilation of the greenhouses work is that we've got uh, intake louvers uh, along one edge of the greenhouse and then exhaust fans on the other. And it's yep. really those exhaust fans drawing the air in and then out 
Um, that's that's the ventilation, and that's true of the individual greenhouses as well as the single greenhouse. Um, although, uh, yeah, obviously, there are some some um, specific engineering questions as to um, are there dead spots and things like that on the interior um, that that someone who works inside the building can probably yeah. speak to a little bit more intelligently than I can. Um, but then the way that those carbon filtration fans work is that they are sized based on a certain number of uh, air changes over a period of time that we want to see going through those filters. Um, and they are circulating air interior to the structure um, constantly um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of scrubbing that air within the interior mm -hmm. um, and then uh, periodically being exhausted based on thermostats. Um, but Jared, I don't know if there's anything else that, that you wanted to chime in with that, that may be helpful detail. If you're on. I know Jared, I did see Jared earlier. I am, uh, sorry, I was muted. Okay, um, yeah, I think you captured that uh, excellently, uh, Chris. That's, that's exactly the way to think about it is um, uh, how many uh, revolutions of air will be done through those um, scrubbers before it's exhausted. And right. so that's that's consistent between these two, uh, the prior and the, and the current version. And the volume of air uh, being exchanged in these two larger greenhouses is, how does that compare to the sum of the volumes of the 12 greenhouses before is it? It should be it should be roughly equivalent. So the prior version, I think, were 34 by 96 foot bays, and these are 30 by 96 foot bays. Um, so they're they're smaller bays, I think, as Chris was alluding to in, in the idea that the um, the footprint has been reduced. Um, so I, I believe it's roughly equivalent, if not a little bit smaller. Okay. All right. So same odor mitigation plan um, will hold up um, even with this change in in from, yeah. from 12 to two. Yeah, so, yes. and I, I would say that, um, you know, certainly on a calculation basis in the design that, um, you know, we would be proposing the same, uh, let's say it's the same, the same filter units and the same number of units per cubic foot of air that we, okay. that we have. So we have really, it's the, it's the air change number um, that, that we would, I believe we committed to, I can't remember if there's a condition on it, um, and that, that we would uphold um, based on the actual volume that's interior to these structures. Yeah, and yes. Uh. Good, good. Just trying to, in some sense, confirm that we're not suddenly looking at two, what you might call big ass fans pumping out vast volumes of. <laughs> no. Yes. Yeah, so if we had 24 filters across the 12 greenhouses now, we'd probably still have 24 or maybe even 26 um, total on the site now. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. And I, I'm not sure that that's the right number. That's that's more of a, a, a explanation than than a specific design. Yeah, it'll still be two per bay, <clears throat> Chris. So that intuition is right. Um, Good. Excuse me, but how many, there were 12 greenhouses in the original plan and how many bigger ones will there be now? Yeah, so just, I'll, I'll do this really explicitly just so it's clear. So in this scheme, there's a row of six greenhouses here. Um, and hopefully you're seeing my cursor move. Yes, so yes. There's a row of six greenhouses here. And then there are the three support structures. I, I don't call them buildings because they're still sort of the same structure as a greenhouse. And now there would be the, the six greenhouses here get replaced with a single structure. The six greenhouses here get replaced with a single structure and the three support structures remain unchanged. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, do we have a motion to uh, accept the amended? Before before we do, I have a comment. Um, we did, we are proposing a definition of indoor cultivation to annual town meeting. Uh, the planning board has approved that at a public hearing. The public hearing was advertised earlier in April. And I consulted with Brian Domina and I believe that once the legal ad has appeared, 
then the zoning is effective. So a change in the site plan would mean that these greenhouses are subject to the odor provision of the of the bylaw. And I don't think it affects our vote, but it may affect the conditions. And certainly the applicant should know that. So um, that, and that's been passed and uh, adopted or there's a, or, or it's, it's been, retroactive it, to the point it was advertised. I'm just curious. I, it's I'm, retroactive I'm, to the point it's, it's advertised. It's obviously dependent on passage at sure. town meeting which was, okay. will be June 15th and then attorney general review. Town council has reviewed the definition. Okay. So I'll make a motion to approve the revised site plan as submitted. Seconded. All right, is there any further discussion? Do we need to review the conditions? I unfortunately didn't think to call them up. So you mean the original conditions, let's see. So that's easy to pull up from the OneDrive. Uh, our final conditions. Chris, do you want to unshare? Yeah, I can share Great. since I've now got the site plan conditions up on my screen. All right. So I think there's this first condition. There should be no issues with that. There's been no change with the security fence. Nothing about historical artifacts have changed. Nothing about historical lighting has changed. Nothing about cultivation of different marijuana varieties. Landscape plantings, that plan is unchanged here. Nothing about the fence post has changed. Uh, there was this condition about the exhaust fans for the drying building shall face to the south and that's not one of the greenhouses, right? That's one of those Correct. three That's buildings building. to the north. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That was just again making sure we're not aiming anything odoriferous at our northerly butter. That's unchanged. This should be fine. No exterior lighting. And this was that same issue about excessive offensive odor. I okay. think that's still appropriate. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call for a roll call vote. Don, yes. Sarah? Hello. 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 Sorry, you? you're you're muted. Did you vote? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Brett. Yes. Judy. Yes. Okay. The motion. I'm uh, sorry, Tom. Yes. Okay. The motion passes unanimously. And uh, could could we make a request that, um, given that we have invested and progressed along uh, this plan? Um, with the anticipation that the um, that the standard that would be applied to us was as it was written at the time that we applied, that an exemption be made for projects that uh, commenced prior to um, this um, town meeting decision, um, as there is that uh, exemption for greenhouses that exist prior to April 2018 or whatever it is. Um, in the bylaws. Are you for, telling us that you've started work on these greenhouses without well, I'm, I'm asking whether that would be possible. Well, if you started work on the greenhouses without our permission, then that doesn't. Uh, we've commenced investing in the property, is what I'm saying. No, I understand that. 
you know, I don't I think, think they is referring to the design point. effort on the greenhouses. Um, the gravel pad has been prepped, which would have supported either the original plan or the amended plan. Yeah. Correct. We didn't change the conditions. I don't think you're. As a practical matter, there's. I would think you would be looking to the condition. Mm -hmm. Right, because the, the biggest thing on that was uh, the odor control. So mm -hmm. that's still being taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, my understanding would be that if a new bylaw is passed, um, that isn't applied retroactively to um, developments in progress. I actually, the fact that they are changing the site plan means it is applied retroactively to the date of the legal ad being posted. So you're saying that even if the bylaw is not approved or if the bylaw is eventually approved at town meeting, it's as if it were enforced in force as of the, the uh, date of publication? As of, yes. It's done, and, it's, it's something that applies only to zoning bylaws and it's done so people don't rush projects ahead to circumvent zoning changes. And we changed the bylaw after the public hearing, is that right? Since we're gonna talk about the change tonight or am I forgetting the chronology? Well, we've already voted the, a change. We've already voted a definitional, a new definition for indoor cultivation. Town Council proposed some wordsmithing to that definition, but I don't think it changes the concept of the fact that we're not going to re-advertise. And it's the date of the legal ad that, that determines the retroactivity. So just help me, at least I'd like to understand what, how does this affect this particular project? So now the new bylaw is what you're saying. Now, um, DNCTC is doing what we are calling indoor cultivation as opposed to outdoor cultivation. And the zoning board would, does this mean that now the zoning board effectively has to reevaluate the project as if it were doing indoor cultivation? No, it just means that the provision, the odor control provision for indoor cultivation, they still only have permission to do outdoor cultivation. They don't have permission to add horticultural lighting mm -hmm. because we haven't imposed any conditions on lighting for those buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so it just affects the odor control. And we did not change the determination, the condition that applied to how the odor control is analyzed. So we're basically covered. So you're and, asking, and yeah. so were they, the conditions right. that have, have been placed on the Seven River Road project. Uh, we addressed the odor mitigation as we wanted then, and then the revisions just basically support that. So in that sense, I think that Jared and company shouldn't have to worry that their um, the change will put their project at risk. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Um, so it's seven oh six oh five. Uh, Todd, um, who's yes? Who's doing the next piece of? presentation. Chris Carney is here from our Levex office. Okay. Hello. I believe. Uh, I work as a land surveyor and civil engineer at our Levex Associates at 40 School Street in Westfield. And I'm here on tonight uh, on behalf of Pazler of Sovereign Builders to discuss the proposed self-storage facility 
off State Road across from Tom Tom. Um, since our last visit, our last meeting, we had a site visit, which uh, I believe some of you have attended. Um, we walked the property, looked at center line of road, edge of driveway, and the proposed building location um, in order to get a feel for the property and see where the driveway will be located in relation to the southerly boundary and where the buildings will be located in relation to the uh, southerly abutter. Since we've already had a number of meetings, I'll just do a brief overview of the project and then answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so what I'm able to present tonight is a revised plan set dated April 29th, 2021. I believe this has been submitted to the planning board as well as all the other boards within the town of Waitley. Uh, the revisions to this plan uh, are shown on C4, C5, and C7. Uh, this property is located off State Road. Uh, Tom's Hot Dogs would be here. And uh, the existing conditions and topography are shown here. You'll notice a wetland area with a water course unnamed uh, at the western side of the property, as well as another wetland to the east side of the property. And those wetland areas really uh, pushed our design. Uh, we always like to preserve those wetland areas as much as possible. So the proposed development has been moved as far away from these wetland areas as possible. On the next two sheets are notes, notes sheets. Uh, the demolition and removal plan shows where there's tree clearing. Uh, that's generally right here. And we've really been able to keep tree clearing to an absolute minimum on this site in order to preserve the site to, to our best abilities. Um, this also shows some erosion control measures, including silt fences and anti-cracking aprons. I'm sure we'll discuss that more with the Conservation Commission. Uh, this layout sheet has been revised. Revisions include the gate location, which was formerly in this area, has been moved towards the front of the property. Uh, this will stop cars from entering the site and backing up here and being out of sight from State Road. We believe this will help uh, improve the safety uh, of the site as well as any safety to adjoining properties. Uh, this is an automatic gate. It can be Bluetooth activated and or be open you know, during business hours. Uh, depending on the applicant's needs. Uh, so cars would enter the site, a Bluetooth will activate the gate and they can enter the site as needed. Uh, if they don't have Bluetooth activation, uh, they could call into the office uh, or they would have to proceed and, and uh, come back at a different time during business hours. Chris, would you uh, clarify, to, so customers would have a, a card or something that would allow them in? Correct. Either a keypad will allow them in, so they would punch in their uh, code, uh, or there would be a Bluetooth device that would link to their phones so that they can uh, enter the facility. I can zoom in on this area a little better. Uh, this would be the location of the proposed gate. And for those of you out there, this is right at the right prior to the wetland crossing where the existing stream is. And for reference, this was the proposed pylon sign that was recently approved with ZBA. I guess to take a step back, we did have a ZBA meeting uh, last week and that uh, the special permits were granted for this property by the ZBA and that has been closed. Uh, but this would be the proposed gate location. So yes, you're correct, uh, Mr. Sutter. Cars would enter right here and there's enough room for two cars to be stacked up here prior to stopping at the gate. So customers would have 24 hour access to this? Uh, only during business hours. Todd can speak better to it, but I believe this facility will be closed at 10 p.m. at night. We, we don't propose 24 hour access. We're, we're proposing hours of operation to end at 10 p.m. And so the gates will be, so the keypad and the Bluetooth will be disabled. Uh, and so the gate won't open regardless of, you know, using a code in the keypad or, or the app on your phone. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want people there after ten o'clock. Uh, the other change that you'll see on this sheet is this co compensatory storage area. This is more of a conservation-related item. It has to do with the amount of fill re uh, added to the site in the floodplain area, and then that's offset by a cut slope here. 
so that no, no additional soils are brought into the flood area. Additional soils could uh, impact downstream flooding, so we would like to avoid that as required by your Conservation Commission and Mass DEP. I know there's a third revision on this sheet um, of the buffer to the south. Uh, that's an important piece here. This buffer previously, the stockade fence had ended here in order to uh, shield the buildings from the southerly abutter. Uh, you know, Todd has volunteered to extend this stockade fence all the way to here. Uh, the southerly abutter has some outbuildings here. So this fence has been extended to a spot where um, the buildings will be blocked when they're in their outbuildings in the rear. Uh, in addition to that, as we move towards the landscaping sheet, you're gonna see that additional plantings have been proposed here uh, behind the proposed guardrail and then also behind the proposed stockade fence. For some, how high, this is Tom Litwood, how high will the, the roadbed be uh, when it's passing by the uh, Butters property? The the three, road, so, road? No, um, let's head towards the, I think that wraps up this sheet anyway, so we'll head to the grading sheet and that'll explicitly describe the cuts and fills. You know, when we're designing a road, we're not trying to make this road too heavy. We're trying to design a nice flat road. So in some areas, there'll be cut slopes and in some areas, there'll be fill slopes. Uh, as I zoom in to the front of the site, you're going to notice that as we move across the, the existing stream bed, obviously the road is going to be raised up so that a new wetland crossing can be placed here. This would be a five foot tall, 10 foot wide open culvert. It'll really look like a bridge. Um, that'll connect these two waterways for both uh, water and wildlife. Uh, it'll be a dramatic improvement to the wetland areas to both the north and south. And so uh, feeling the grades, the grade will rise to this high point here, and then it will trail off here. So this is raised above existing grade. As we move- uh, Excuse me, before you go on, it's raised five feet above the existing grade. I mean, I know it dips there. Yes. Um, How high above street level is it at, at your bridge? I'm going to try to enter our CAD world here. These can give me some very accurate uh, figures to answer your question. We, we build three-dimensional models of both existing grade and proposed grade, and that enables the software to come up with cuts and fills at any place on the site. So I can hover my mouse here and you'll see existing grade is at 138, proposed grade is at 173. So this would be about a five foot fill from existing grade. So how does, that, how does that match with the stockade fence in terms of, is the stockade fence gonna be 12 feet high? Oh no, so uh, on either side of this, in order to reduce slopes on the side and more wetland impacts, retaining walls will be placed on both the northern and southern side of the property. I'm gonna switch back to the plan set. I think he's asking about headlights. So there are no stockade fences to both of this. This is a guardrail in this uh, first section of the property. For, for those that weren't on the, the, the walkthroughs, it, this, this road goes very, it really follows almost the abutters property line. And it's very close and there's concern by the abutters um, of how close this is to their property. Um, so when you, when you raise up the road, um, you're, you're actually creating um, more of an impact on that property than if it were a grade. Um, in, in some ways you are, you know, we, we did our best to limit the amount of fill for a number of reasons, one of them being comp storage and one of them to lower construction costs, but the main reason being to limit wetland impact. You're going to hear me say that a lot tonight because this project is stuck between a couple of different boards review. Zoning board recently approved this project. We'll be heading to conservation though. Conservation will like this road to be as far away from wetlands as possible. So uh, when designing this, we allowed an eight foot separation from the southerly side of the driveway to the southerly property line. 
and that allows for both the guardrail and stockade fence to be placed in this area, as well as a plant things to be placed in this buffer area, the eight foot buffer. So, but, so what is the distance to the property line from the, that, that guardrail? Uh, the guardrail is two feet off the edge of pavement, so that would be six feet from the guardrail to the property line. In those six feet is where the plantings uh, will be placed. Do I remember that the roadbed is about three feet above grade there? Uh, it, the roadbed right here is um, set, yeah, 171 would be the contour here. So uh, without going back into AutoCAD, you, you are correct. This is about two feet of fill right here. And uh, so this first, the entryway, the beginning of the driveway is ge generally above grade. And then we hit a point right here where there, we match existing grade quite well. Beyond that, it turns into a cut. You'll see the neighboring grades here are 175, and then we go down to 174 and 173 for the road bed. Um, and that generally continues uh, this way, where the, the site is, um, here we hit another daylight line, but generally the site uh, will be above grade here, below grade here, and then very close to existing grade uh, here. So what, the so what the Conservation Commission will be looking at is the placement of the building, the footprint of the building? Yes, there are a number of uh, jurisdictions here. Um, wetlands have a 50-foot and 100-foot wetland offset line. That, this is shown here as the, let me get to a sheet that shows this better. I'll actually head right to the landscaping sheet so we can look at the plants. So in theory, the building could be modified based on CONSCOM's review of the project. Yes, and so um, as, as you see, this is the 50 foot wetland and the 100 foot wetland. We were able to place the buildings outside of this 100 foot wetland area um, and the building outside of the 50 foot on the easterly side. So those are the wetland buffers. Generally, we try to keep all work outside of the 50 foot buffer. There's usually a little bit of play with between the 50 and the 100 foot buffer for work. You're going to see this 50 foot buffer line uh, cross the road. And, and here you'll notice that this roadway is inside of the 50 foot buffer. Uh, conservation will be taking a, a close look at this area. And uh, I do not feel that moving this closer to the wetland is going to be something Conservation Commission will do favorable. That's what, what is um, or to the, the north? What is that um, beyond the building itself? That uh, that that area there. What is that? Uh, this is a bioretention area. It's another stormwater feature. We have an unplanted, uh, open uh, stormwater basin, more conventional here. This one is a shallow basin, only about two feet deep, and it's planted with a variety of different plants to improve wildlife characteristics as well as provide a buffer uh, to the northerly property. So stormwater will enter this and infiltrate into the ground. Uh, getting back to wetland jurisdictions and, and buffers, uh, you'll see this next buffer being a 100 foot inner riparian zone and a 200 foot outer riparian zone. You'll see we place this building outside of the 200 foot uh, both Masty EP and your Conservation Commission would like to see as much of the site improvements to be outside the riparian and riverfront area. These are probably the stronger buffers that need to be maintained as part of the project, especially keeping buildings out of them and septic systems out of these areas. Uh, so we did our best, again, to limit the development to areas as far away from the wetland area as possible. And this crossing has been placed in an area to be as far away from the wetland as possible in order to limit wet, uh, impacts to the wetland. Uh, so we feel this is a marriage between uh, providing a buffer to the southerly property line as the planning and ZBA would like to see, as well as creating a buffer area sufficient for conservation. Chris, I wasn't paying much attention when you zoomed in on the road, but um... 
there is a crown on this, right? With with sloping up both ways. Yeah, actually, on this in this road, there is not a crown. It it is a super elevated road with a slight pitch, and um, I can zoom in on that uh, in the grading sheet, and we can under, to understand better why that's happened, why it was designed in this fashion. So, so it pitches away from the the the, uh, the abutter to the south then. Exactly. Water okay. will appear and it will slope to the north where it will be captured by either a catch basin on the northerly side of the road here or a catch basin on the northerly side of the road here before hitting pipes and entering this uh, sub this basin here. Okay, thank you. Uh, so these wetland buffers were of very high importance for us to try to protect to the maximum extent practicable. And the other, Great. the other, the, the other conversation that was had was there's some very, very large trees in there, probably old growth size trees. Mm -hmm. Will they be preserved? I, all, I think all trees that are healthy and in good condition after construction will be preserved to the maximum extent possible. I think those larger trees really improve the aesthetic of the of the development, and every effort I think will be made to maintain those trees. Some of them may be close enough to the road where their roots will be damaged and they won't remain healthy, and those trees would need to be removed during construction. I think we asked to see the site of the big beach on the drawings. Yeah, uh, the site of the big beach would be. It's, it's not shown on this plan set. Uh, but it, it is in this area uh, about right here. And as you see it, it lands in a spot where there's minimal grading. And so all our effort to, to keep the tree line nice and tight for this uh, development and to reduce grading really comes into play right now when trees will be able to be preserved as much as possible. This uh, design does a much better job than many designs do of keeping the tree line very close to the road and limiting grading uh, to the road. You see these daylight lines where it meets existing grade, they're very small. These are about only about six to eight feet. The grades will be resolved and you'll have natural ground surrounding the site. That, that is done uh, in order to keep the filtration and wetland areas uh, as pristine as possible. And back, back to the road, how, um, uh, Judy's question about headlights on the neighbor's property, the butter's property. Um, what, what, again, what, what is the elevation of the roadbed in the relationship to the butter's property and buildings? Uh, the, it's about two feet above. You'll see 173 here with the um, neighboring property at 171. So even at the highest point, you're, we're about two feet uh, above the neighboring property. And how tall is the stockade fence? Uh, there's a guardrail proposed here, as well as maintaining the existing trees out there. But really, um, again, trying to keep this wetland area in its natural state as much as possible. The, the question was how tall is the fence? Uh, this fence is six feet tall. The fence begins here. This is the, as required by your bylaws, it's, it's intended to shield the proposed buildings from the subtly of butter. It had ended here, but uh, I decided, you know, in an effort to keep uh, the subtly of butter protected as much as possible, that it was extended to here. And let's take a look at the plantings as well. So in, in all honesty, that the abutters are going to be getting headlights at, at night on their property. Well, as they come around this prop at this corner, I mean, the, these curves are such that, you know, that while it's designed to be a two way street, there's really going to be one car on this street. The, the chances of the two way traffic happening, it's going to be a rare occurrence on this site. Uh, and these curves are not such that you'll be 90 degrees into the neighboring property. You know, these are gentle, large radius curves. I, I think these headlights will either be generally addressed by the remaining trees or by these U trees. Uh, 
I believe the plants were selected based on your um, comments at the last meeting. So I'll zoom in on what they are. Uh, these were selected to be Irish yew trees. They're similar to arborvitaes, but more deer resistant, and they're not arborvitaes, which I know that was a request by the board. I'll, I'll bring you up to some pictures. Of uh, this is an Irish yew tree. As you can see, it's similar to uh, arborvitae, but it also grows a little larger and can be shaped to be, uh, you know, to match garden qualities. It's a Uh, so these plants will be placed, 20 of them will be placed uh, spaced pretty tightly along the southerly uh, boundary in order to create that buffer and to try to capture any headlights that may not be captured by existing trees. And how tall are, how tall will they be? It will be uh, two to three feet at planting and, and they can grow, as you can see, quite large. So they can get to 15 or 20 feet in, in height and about eight feet in width. That would make them touching edge to edge. So if they're two feet at planting, they don't even cover the guardrail. Uh, two to three feet in height. Yeah. So they would be just above the guardrail at time of planting. The guardrail is two feet years over the before, It'll be years before they have an impact on the property, on the neighbor's property. Also, we generally like to see, as we explained before, mixed plantings. Deer resistance was, was one of the attributes. I, you know, I did my best to, to try to find an evergreen shrub that was deer resistant um, and, you, you know, would provide a thick buffer to the uh, south, both in summer and winter conditions. And in that search, there are hollies, there are um, rhododendrons. I think you can, I think you were focusing very narrowly, but that's, that's another, but I think we would be talking a minimum of eight or 10 feet for for plantings, and I'm not sure you've got enough. How much width is there to the to the driveway? The driveway width is 24 feet. No, so from the from the, from the guardrail to, to the, the fence to the guardrail is. Uh, from the fence to, from the guardrail to the property line is approximately six feet. Would I be able to jump in here just with uh, Rich Corpia scale of number five and I was kind of piggybacking on the meeting here. If I can, if you would indulge. Those trees are on the uh, northern side of the abutting property, which is going to have trees. Now, if they don't get enough sunlight, they're not going to grow. Regardless of what you put there, it's not going to grow. And I've got well, I trees I put in and I get a little bit of sun over there and they're not growing. Things I put in the middle of the yard that they've taken off like crazy. If there's not enough sun, they're not going to grow anyway. No, the, the grow is, of course, is uh, related directly to the amount of sunlight and plant types. These ewes, though, are selected because they are shade tolerant and will grow in partial shade. They're going to grow a lot slower in, part, in filtered sunlight, for sure. Understood. So I, I think we've lost, we've lost sight of the fact that there's, a, there's at least a 50-foot buffer that's heavily treated at this time between the boundary line and the abutter's residence. So there's, there's a substantial established tree buffer that exists there now. I think in vision, when you look at this planet, it seems like there's nothing beyond the property line. Yes, but uh, agreed, Todd. When we were there on the site walk, we were able to stand at the stakes that represent where this building will be placed. And when we looked to the south, there, there, we could not see the outbuildings. I, I could not see the outbuildings. But you're going to be clearing that, though. We, that was before it was clear. We're not clearing any anything on the neighbor's property. All the trees that exist now are 50 feet of large oaks and, and smaller oaks. There's a very established tree buffer between my property line and the abutters residence or outbuildings. Uh, so there, there's really a, a, a very large buffer of trees that are established, you know, good size oak trees. From looking at this plan, it looks as though we're gonna be shining lights directly from our the proposed driveway into the neighbor's house, but there's a there's a 50 foot buffer of very well established trees between the, the you know 58 feet if you count the eight feet that the roadway is back from the edge. The buffer is not that it's that wide to the house, but it's very close to the 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 outbuildings are very close to to the property line. Correct. And one of the outbuildings is is probably on the property line. It, it looks as though it's, uh, you know, 
in disrepair or maybe coming down there's there's holes in the roof of that building i don't you know so i don't think they're using that building but they'd have he to said he that. was storing equipment in it uh -huh. well so I, I don't believe it is properly set back from the property line but i also don't think that we are con are we concerned about lights shining in on his tractor or yeah, so the outbuildings Todd is speaking of are approximately here, and you'll see that their residence is, is here. But that's not the residence there. The residence is in a shaded spot over here. It's in between. You really can't see it on this map right in there. That's where the house is. Still a significant uh, exist a wooded buffer will remain between the proposed building and this general area, and the existing driveway being re-improved from the existing wood road to a formal driveway, which we need to are, you, are you on uh, Google Earth? Yes, I can. Oh, would you like to see the street view? No, no, no. Uh, is, are you using Google Earth on this? I'm using Google Maps right now, which is you know, very similar to Google Earth. Well, Google Earth allows you to uh, go to different years so that you can see um, some some stuff taken in the fall. Yep. Here we can, uh, we're looking at generally the same pictures as we were. On Google Maps, and then we can go back in time, as mentioned. And let's let's do that. Okay. Here you can see the existing roadbed. Here again, it is an existing driveway where cars do drive uh, or can drive. And the proposed buildings will be in this area with the proposed with the existing house here. And if I zoom in a little more, we can start to see uh, the the backyard of the abutting property. Um, as far as the plants selected for the southerly property line, I can appreciate that a variety of plants is uh, one of the comments that you'd make, and, and I don't, I can't speak directly for Todd, but I don't think this plant selection for this uh, project is, is a deal breaker. We'd be happy to switch out some of these plants with a rhododendron or a holly as requested by the board. There is a, a you know, as you know, it's a small width, which makes have finding the correct plant uh, difficult. Rhododendrons have a tendency to spread beyond a three foot radius. Uh, and as do a holly can really turn into a tree. Well, it somewhat depends on, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but I think the trees that you, if you, if you don't want to see um, any headlights and stuff coming through there, I think what you've chosen is, is probably pretty good. But yeah, and what, considering the outbuildings for, you know, vehicle storage or back here, tractor storage, whatever it is, these, this line of shrubs, it, you know, the headlights will not be perpendicular to this road. They'll be going along it. And, and these shrubs, as they mature, will do a very good job of capturing the light that's traveling down the road uh, so that it doesn't hit that storage building. How many units are going in? Approximately 405 units. But the, lay the layout is sometimes subject to change because the unit size sizes may change on the interior. But as currently laid out with the unit sizes as they are, it's about a 405. But some of those may be divided into smaller units, um, but most likely not. So how many trips a day? For how much traffic is this estimated to be? So we have, we have a letter from 
uh, a gentleman that spent his life uh, developing and marketing and selling. And uh, Chris, I don't know if you have the letter that if you could share it uh, and does feasibility studies and, and has all kinds of data on self storage and his estimation is on uh, on a high point which is on a saturday afternoon potentially five patrons would be at the site so um it's very limited number of trips per day this is this is a this use typically people rent their unit and essentially forget it so to speak and travel there very seldom the highest use is in the beginning when when we're just uh beginning to rent units but on, on on a on the busiest part of the week which is a saturday afternoon you might have five cars total trips per day on a saturday maybe 10 or 12. i think that's an important uh, thing to 50 know. on a saturday what's that that's 50 on a saturday no 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 10 or 12 total by five people trips per day on a saturday 10 or 12. so that means five you know 10 cars how yeah, large no, are these units how much large are these that he's examining because my son has a unit he's there at least weekly what's that my son has a unit he goes to his unit weekly okay and that's well, nowhere near as big as this um these the ones that he's typically dealing with are larger than this, usually in the range of 90,000 to 110,000 square feet is where most of his data lies. So this unit is substantially smaller than, than those that, that, are, that are typically built. Todd, how did you arrive at the 400 and some odd number of units? Why, why, is, that, why is it that large? Oh, it's really, it's, it's, just, it, what's, it's what fits on three stories in that footprint and there's there's there is a, a unit mix, which is most viable, which is a mi mixture of five by fives, five by tens, ten by tens, ten by twenties. Um, there's a unit mix that that is most profitable, and so that's actually generated by the company that uh, proposes to supply the building. So that's where that that comes from. Then you integrate so would, would it. Still, would it still be viable with 300 units, 250 units in your mix? The mix you described. I mean, if 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 we're if you're going to adjust, uh, so the answer is the long and the short of it is no. The project becomes much less useful if you limit the number of units uh, because you're, you're you're you'll end up increasing the size of the units. And so, yes, it's, it becomes difficult and less profitable. You need to have, you need to serve a, a wide variety of people because there are people who only need to store a few boxes and there are other people that want to put a car in. I mean, so you really, you really have to have a wide variety of choices. Excuse me, we you are having auction traffic. I mean, there, there are, at times there are auctions when if you know if units are are but it's not like you see on television you know it's it's very un, uncommon that you have units of any value that would go to auction most often what people leave behind are are things that go in a dumpster and and it, you know so it's really not like the tv show uh, there's uh, a tv show for that there is there is actually and uh it's 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 staged with all kinds of good things to make the show exciting. But mostly what people, what happens when people move out or, or they don't pay their rent. Oftentimes when people move out, they try to find an empty unit to put their, the things that they don't want in it. Unfortunately, people store a lot of things that they should throw away. That's the reality. But it still goes to auction first, so you can recoup some of your losses if they don't pay. Correct? No, we we once once they don't pay, we have, we we essentially own the unit. We have the right to the unit. If, if we see that there's value in there, we would auction it. Right. I guess I guess places down the road and such, and seeing what's been in the paper is what I'm referring to, and uh, other activity by people I know who have gone to unit auctions. I haven't, so I can't say speak personally. But I wanted to understand that. It, 
periodically you will have auctions on site. I'm assuming they'll be on Saturdays. Is that a fair assumption? I don't, I'm, you know, to be honest with you, I, I have not been an operator of self storage. I don't have a clear answer for that. Right. Um, it but would that seem would to have, be, a, what's that, that? would impact the neighbor. I mean, those, that's additional traffic that would impact the neighbors, you know, and that's my concern would be, well, how would it impact the neighbor? I think I, you know, I understand your concerns about the impact of the, of the neighboring property. I really do. And I think that, uh, the location of these buildings are quite a bit, you know, they're the proximity from the actual buildings to their residences is, is, is it is, is a good distance. I also think that we need to look at the fact that that property is commercial and may at some time in the future transition from a residence to a commercial use. Um, it doesn't mean that we disregard that it is currently a residence but this is commercially zoned and um, this is of commercial uses, one that really has abs you know, limited traffic compared to most taxes, public utilities and the school system, virtually none uh, and generates a good tax base for the town. So of the, if the neighbors, I understand the concerns, but if they could choose this is one that's got very little traffic, generates a good deal of tax base, doesn't tax any of the, of the public services, the city, serve, the town services. Well, I've watched the um, self storage unit near the uh, grade school in Sunderland for a number of years. And I have to say, I only go by it two or three times a day, but uh, I've never seen more than a few cars in there ever. Because I go by about 10 in the morning and usually come back around four in the afternoon. So um, those to me would be peak times uh, that, that people might be there. So I'm not, not much concerned about um, getting crowds in there. I do have a question, which is, are we, as a planning board, con concerned about traffic to the degree where we're even contemplating imposing some kind of condition that would make this effectively economically infeasible for the applicant? And I guess I'm curious where this conversation is going. I personally feel that the, the issues that I heard coming in tonight were um, water flowing south uh, and flooding into the abutters property. It seems to me that's been addressed. I think there was a concern. Um, there was some concern about um, let's call it light pollution, headlight pollution as vehicles are traversing. I think that's partly addressed by the fact that this property is not operating 24 hours a day. Um, so uh, not, not fully. My impression is that the screening is either sufficient or I'd like to hear some concrete proposals about how it be changed um, so we can establish conditions as a board on this that the applicant could address. So, and then, then there's this third traffic issue that I, so I, I guess I wonder, I'd like to sort of to see, start to bring this conversation to some kind of closure. We should have an impact statement because this is over 10,000 square feet that goes through all these things, including attendance at public schools, increases in vehicular traffic, changes to the number of legal residents. I mean, it's due to the size there should be in per our zoning, there's supposed to be an impact statement. So, I mean, we've addressed a lot of these verbally, but is that tick, 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 was that presented as part of the site plan? I know, no, Sarah, reading, reading that bylaw condition, I think that was primarily aimed at residential developments. It's also any floor area over 10,000 square feet. I understand. I, I think they by and large address, address the verbally and, and with the statement for the 
the traffic that's that's the one that was missing i um we haven't addressed access safety and visibility from the roadside and i had to leave the the site walk before that was discussed i don't know if if that was discussed well, I, I think an important topic that's hanging out there is the, the meeting, uh, the next CONSCOM meeting. Um, I'm not sure how we can develop conditions until we know what the final determination is going to be by CONSCOM on, in terms of the size of the building, the siting of the building. Um, yet, yes, that they, they will want to protect the resource and adhere truly and strictly to the Wetlands Act, but they do have leeway. They do have leeway within those regulations. Um, and I think we should. My my recommendation is that we, we we continue the hearing until we hear the outcome of the consecoms, and then then we know what's happening on the ground to which we can respond from a site plan point of view. Well, normally, anyway. what we would do on that, Tom, is is require approval of of concom, and that would cover that. I understand that, Don, and normally that's what we do, but this one is so complex and there's so many intricacies and they, they all impact things that we care about from our point of view. So, so I, I actually agree with Tom on this one. I think it's very hard for us to establish conditions till we know how things are cited in this case. Normally, that would not be true, or much less true. Uh, I can appreciate those concerns. While I, I do have to note that this, the proposed development is placed and in, wedged into a position where there really isn't much leeway to the south or to the north. I can't imagine any substantial changes. We're reusing the site of the existing culvert and wetland crossing. That's going to be fixed because we will want to replace the existing culvert with a new improved bridge. Uh, and then we're just moving the road as far to the south as we can in order to maintain this planted buffer here and um, maintain the wetland buffer. Conservation will ask, can you move the driveway closer to the southerly abutter? And I think that's that conversation, I will point them to your comments and concerns with that planted buffer. I will have to say, that eight feet is going to be required based on planning department comments. Mm -hmm. and so it, they will not be moving the road closer to the wetland. That's an impossibility. So I, I really feel effectively the design that you see in front of you, it, it, there's really not a lot of room for change. When do you see CONCOM? Uh, we see CONCOM, I believe the site visit is on Monday and then the uh, Probably the 18th. 18th? It's, it's actually the 19th. I, cons come, I believe, is on the public hearings on the 19th. Next week, we'll be in front of Comic Con. And Mass DEP will have their comments in, hopefully, by that meeting. And uh, addressing site distances and the driveway at the front, and, and Judy's comments about that. After we fi finish, uh, hopefully, finish lately. Um, municipal permitting process, this will be submitted to the Mass DOT, and they will do an in-depth site distance analysis at this driveway location, and uh, we'll have to adhere to any comments they may have. There's a lot of protection in this site, uh, so your local planning and um, conservation and zoning has some protection of both Mark Stinson over at Mass DEP in his review, as well as Jay Ely over at Mass DOT in his review. So, there are a lot of eyes, not just on your local level, but at the state level looking at this. Problem. I know it's a complicated wetland crossing, but we deal with this type of project very regular. We, we dotted our I's and crossed our T's, and we feel that, that the package that we submit to both your conservation department and Mass DEP is thorough and will address the concerns that they will uh, have. Well, I have to say that this is probably the most thorough thoroughly designed site plan um, I've seen in a long while. I think you have crossed your T's and dotted your I's. Um, I think it would be prudent for us to go ahead and continue this 
until after the CONCOM. Um, and I would uh, suggest that uh, if any members don't agree with that, uh, let, we, can, we can discuss that. But I think it's probably a good idea to continue this until our next regularly scheduled meeting. I would support that, but I do have a question, Don. Is there a risk? So right now, in effect, what we're saying is um, we can't make a decision about what conditions we might impose on this plan until we've heard from the CONSCOM. Right. So we're going to kick this over to the CONSCOM, and then, then the, is there a risk that after we hear from CONSCOM, we might do something where um, it would have to get kicked back to CONSCOM. Basically, I'd like to make sure that we don't get into keep passing this ball back and forth between two committees. Would, if CONSCOM can do their thing, would we have everything that we need to do at that point to resolve this for all involved? The, uh, the, the, what CONSCOM will, have, will work within the, the guidelines of the, the Wetlands Protection Act and come to the conclusion based on the guidance from the Wetlands Protection Act, applying whatever flexibility they have within those regulations. So it's not a matter of ping pong. Once, the, once they've made that determination, we all own it. Mm -hmm. And so there are some cases where the planning board can make its decision without waiting for CONSCOM, but we uh, there's an con emerging consensus, it sounds like, that this particular plan, we really need to hear from CONSCOM first. Is that correct? Well, I mean, the, an example of that is the Hannum project with the, co the common driveway. That the, 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 the wetland impact is so discreet and so well-defined and so small that um, there, there's, there's nothing, to, nothing that would spill over into our jurisdiction that would influence it. Mm -hmm. I think the pro problem here is the project is Surrounded by drainage and wetland and old and, growth trees and, and old and growth trees and, and things very that close to the abutter. So that any small change may impact something that we would do, whereas that's rarely true. If I, we were to continue I this, when would we continue this to? Would 25th. we be able to do this on the 25th? I think so. And so we'd know by May 25th, the outcome of the CONSCOM meeting. Is that correct? Chris? Uh, yes. Okay. And I, I guess it, I've been stuck in that circle where planning boards kick it to conservation and conservation kicks it back to planning. Eventually one, one of these groups will have to put their foot forward and uh, likely it sounds like it might be conservation and you'll wait on their determination. Um, I guess at, at the request that we would make at this stage is that if there are any revisions to the plans that you are foresee, that we try to address these now, that way conservation doesn't get stuck in the same situation that you're now stuck. That, oh, I would like the driveway to be moved here, or I would like these plants to be changed for those plants. Well, I would like to bring those revisions to conservation so they have a full plan set. Right. I think that's very fair to ask of the planning board. So are there conditions based on the discussion tonight? I've heard none. I mean, maybe I've heard I'll, I'll make the same plants. request. I'll make the same request that I made at the site plan that the heritage trees and the large trees be shown on the plan. I mean, the, 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 the whole discussion is about the road. So the, one proposal is that the, the road be moved another six feet to the north. Is that possible within the leeway that the CONSCOM has? And I know, I, you know I, I, I take on good faith that this has been put, played out um, in the spirit and intent of the Wetlands Act, but is there flexibility the CONSCOM has within, within their jurisdiction where you could move that road six feet to the north and increase the buffer and preserve, protect the neighbor's privacy and their, their, their quality of life, save some of those old growth trees and have a good 
commercial project? I mean, is that possible if there's some coordination here? I do have a question, Tom. My understanding is that if we're interested in preserving a large beech tree that's on the northern edge of that road, and we ask that that road be moved further to the north, we are comfortable taking down that tree then. Well, I think it would be that all might... important that you'd want to be able to have those on the map as to where they are. So when you're looking at this, you can make those determinations later. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're not recognized here in any way, are they? No. no. They're no. not, but they, they were marked on site. And it, I think there were two trees that were concerned. One was the beach. And it looked as if we can work around the beach. We can certainly mark it on the plan. And then there was yeah. another very large. Uh, very large hemlock. Couple the, of large, the, the hemlock, couple. I think, is, is going to be in, not going to be able to be saved. It's in an area where there's where there's parking and so on, I think it's very difficult to save the hemlock. Under the current design? Correct. Well, that's where we're, what we're struggling with, Tr trying to come up with a, a win for the abutter, a, a compromise win for the abutter, a compromise win for you, so you can have a viable and, and successful commercial project, and a compromise that protects as number of those trees as possible. The missing information here is, is what flexibility within, within the, the spirit and intent of the Wetlands Act does the CONSCOM have to try and accommodate that? I mean, I, 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 I think we have to define what would be a win for the abutter. And in considering that, what, what defines what, it's, what is a win for the abutter, we have to also understand that there are no other abutters here in opposition. I understand, you know, and, and there's a fairly large area between my property line and the abutters residence. So, I mean, I think we have to be really clear, clear as to what is a win for a, a, for the abutter, what would be a use that would be um, more of a win or what, how can we, uh, how can we condition this use so it's more of a win for the abutter? It's not clear to me how, how it could be more of a win because this is a very a low travel, low, very, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a light use. So I, I think it starts as a win compared to many. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on that comment directly and just note that while an impact statement is something that may be in the bylaws, this use is the lowest of use possible for this type of development. That vehicular traffic, noise, et cetera, it is, not a, it is not a restaurant or something that will have people spilling out over the property line. Uh, in addition to that, reviewing your zoning bylaws, the, the setback requirement is, is a driveway permit requirement. I know we're all aware of that. It's not actually in the bylaws. So th there's nothing uh, in your ordinance or bylaws that require this driveway to be set back 20 feet from the property line. Uh, in addition, the planting buffer that Todd's proposed is, is in, in addition to the required stockade fence. I, I really feel like Todd's going above and beyond with providing a wetland buffer to the existing commercial property to, to the south. That property was bought while it was a commercial use and those neighbors understand they purchased in a commercial zone. Uh, understanding that this site will be developed at some point, this development provides one of the lowest impacts possible for this site. Uh, can I just jump in here? That property has always been a, a residential use. I mean, I've lived in Waitley for you know, 70, 50 yeah. years. Um, that's always been a residential use. I've known a number of the people who have lived there. Um, it is a commercial property, but it was residential use before it was a commercial property. It's still residential use now. Um, my, my other question concerned about the development of this simply is just, you know, what's you're putting all the burden of shielding or putting much of the burden of shielding any light resources onto the neighboring property because your, your fencing is low and your plantings are obscured by you know, their trees, I understand. But, but the burden ends up being on them more so than you since you're so far south and so close to the property line. Did I understand that the, the buildings were three-story high? Did I understand that correctly or was I misinformed? The center building is three-story high. The it's a three-story high long. building. And I'm so I, it's lit 24 hours a day. It's lit in the evening. You, you have to identify between lights from vehicles, which are at three and a half feet, and lights from the building. There's no light pollution. The site has a photometric plan 
that shows that no light from the buildings, no lighting from the building will go onto the neighboring property. So we're talking about two different types of light, one from vehicle traffic, which is at three and a half feet right. from the from ground level, which a stockade fence will block from the neighboring property. The other, the other is from wall pack type lighting that would be on the lower level of the three-story building shown on the plan. And none of that light goes on to the neighboring property. That's a plus. Uh, and as well as the stockade fence, those uh, white pines are planted to the south of this. Those will eventually overtop that stockade fence and provide that vertical buffer to shield the entire building from the southerly abutted property. I think we should just continue this till the 25th. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second it. Any further discussion? Roll call, Don, yes. Judy? Yes. Tom? Yes. Sarah? Yes. yes. And uh, who, am I, who am I missing? Me, Brandt. I'm Brand. gonna vote. I'm gonna vote no. Okay, well, the, the um, motion passes with a, with a majority vote. We should set a time, and I don't remember what the other agenda items are. I apologize. Tell you in a second from. We don't the have a formal agenda yet. Um, oh, we don't have an agenda written. Just the legal ad for. We have the pump house. Um, yeah. And we set that for what time? Uh, 5.15 according to the legal ad. Yeah, so, so then this could be at 5.45. It doesn't seem like the pump house will need that much time. The cemetery commission has some issues. Yeah, no, what I mean is I think allowing 30 minutes seems reasonable. Okay, thank you. Okay, so continue till the 25th at 545. And so let's at least ask that uh, the applicant, that Sovereign comes back with a revised map that just marks the trees of interest and I confess, I have no idea what we consider to be trees of interest. I mean, are we asking them to have an arborist review them? We're just asking them to put on trees that we personally like. I mean, what are we asking them to put on the plan? We we pointed them out to them at, at the site plan walk. Um, they're way bigger than the other growth in the area. And presumably because it was a pasture at one point and they were there for shade or it was the edge of the pasture. So I think they're quite familiar with, with what we're looking for. Henlock and the beach previously mentioned. Chris, do you have the approximate location of that that you can yeah, show I, us on this plan? Yeah, the hemlock would be in this area here. It was inside of the paved area by a number of feet. Uh, the, the beach it was is best shown on the grading plan best viewed on there, there is a, there's a, a strong chance that that can be saved. It will depend on the root formation of the trees, which you just can't see until excavation, but uh, it's in a spot where cut and fills are balanced and existing grade is matched at the road. It's a coincidence of the design, but it, it will allow for, you know, for us to possibly save that tree during development. If you happen to show it on the plan, uh, you can go out and GPS the locations of these trees and add it to a, a, an additional um, picture or, or a sketch for the next meeting. Okay, well, if you would bring that with you. Uh... I think to have it for the CONCOM meeting would be helpful. Yes. And I will be bringing this plan set to conservation with uh, no revisions, or notable, and no review. 
I will ask them if they if there's a if they would like to move the road closer to the wetland area. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you for your, for your time tonight. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Have, have a good night. night. Hey, Karen, I'll see you on the 25th at 440, 545. Okay, you're going to unshare your screen? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Looks like just their review of the town council's council. changes. Yep. What about the three river road? Was Chris Chamberlain done? Yeah. I'm still here. We were hoping to um, submit our application for site plan review on that project. Which has to be done at a ready to schedule meeting. So why don't you just um, show it to us quickly and um, we will. Yes, I'll be very brief and just highlight the, the key issues. Then obviously we'll have uh, a discussion of it at the public hearing. Um, so this um, is Project at Three River Road, um, which is a property immediately next to Seven River Road, um, currently the CNA repair shop. Um, the property also has on it um, Carolyn A's house. I'm sorry, I, 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 I always mix that up. Um, AI. AI. AI, that's it. That's why I, I never want that to be the answer. Um, in any event, this is the survey of the property. So this is the Seven River Road property over here. Um, this is Three River Road here. And you'll notice that a portion of this property is actually in Hatfield, which I'll also mention very briefly. Um, and so in the existing condition, uh, so this, this, project, this property is in the AR1 zone. In the existing condition, it has a non-conforming use of the small engine repair shop. And so what we are pro uh, proposing is to um, convert that existing non-conforming use into a new non-conforming use, that being marijuana manufacturing or sometimes known as processing. We have an application into the ZBA um, requesting that. The ZBA has the power to grant a special permit for a non-conforming use when there's an existing non-conformance if they determine that the new use would not be and the language is substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conformance. Um, and that's, uh, you know, part of our part of our application is to try to demonstrate that we believe that to be the case. And I, I won't get into the details of that at, at this time for this application. Um, and um, additionally, we are also um, in the process of reaching out to the Hatfield Planning Board to determine if we need to do any permitting with them. None of the buildings or structures um, uh, are within Hatfield. And there's no proposed expansion of those structures. Some of the site will be, um, so it'll be, uh, we'll have to clarify whether we need to appear before them at all or not, uh, but we're gonna be making that request. Um, the, um, we provided the typical site context plan and existing conditions. I think um, everybody's familiar with the site. Um, there's the existing building, um, a number of uh, paved and gravel areas, as well as some outbuildings and then uh, a number of, let's say, stored vehicles um, within the site. And so in the proposed condition, um, we were proposing to leave the building um, exactly as it is, although with extensive um, renovations on the inside uh, to convert it to the proposed use. Um, and uh, on the exterior, the, the things that I wanna highlight uh, and make sure you, you see when you look at these plans ahead of, our next meeting um, is that we do um, require expanded parking. Um, as, uh, and so we are proposing um, to provide that um, primarily in this location here. Um, the, uh, and <laughs> I'm gonna apologize. My battery is actually starting to run low, but Jared does have the plans if we need to pull them up or, or um, take a good look now. Um, and I'll dial in in a second, but uh, we are close. Uh, I, we would be over the zoning coverage 
Um, so we are proposing that these new hard surfaces be done in a porous asphalt, and we have an engineered design for that so that it is truly permeable. We're not just saying we're putting gravel on the ground um, and, and then uh, claiming that that's uh, permeable pavement. Um, and then, you know, another key feature of this site is that we are proposing um, to be using um, portable uh, refrigerated containers, um, and we can uh, discuss that at more length. Um, but the purpose of that is so that the containers can be uh, can start on Seven River Road, be filled with the harvested uh, product uh, at that time when the harvest comes in in large volumes, and uh, stored, and then run through the processing um, uh, the process uh, the the manufacturing process here at Three River Road, um, and then also in the packet. Um, you know, well, so again, um, the existing site as it is today. Um, and then also what we provided, so there's some uh, certainly lack of knowledge of exactly what these processes look like. And so what we provided is a similar, it won't be exactly the same uh, manufacturing processing operation. And, you know, the things that we want to highlight are that this is much more like a pharmacological laboratory than it is uh, any kind of factory. Um, so we provide that context. And then we've also provided a uh, narrative ticking off all of this different special permit conditions and um, why we believe we would comply with those um, as well as a uh, traffic statement and all sort of those um, uh, normal issues. And then, you know, we've, we've noted uh, those areas where we believe that the proposed plan would not be more uh, substantially more detrimental than the existing plan. Um, and so uh, this is our application for site plan review. Um, and uh, we'd love it if you'd schedule us a public hearing and, and we'll be looking forward to discussing this project at length then. Thank you, Chris. And uh, can you want to share that? Uh, yes, sorry. Any, any questions from from the board? Okay, we will uh, schedule that. Do we have time on the twenty fifth? We can't advertise by then. Yeah, All right, I don't have time for that, I think. Okay, so um, probably the June ish June meeting, regular meeting. Or last Tuesday. Are you anticipating just the one meeting in June? We'd like to. I know sometimes you don't know whether there'll be a Actually, second that's the Tuesday, the 15th is town meeting, so we can't do it then. And the rain date is the 22nd, so it has, probably has to be the 29th. We're getting very tired of two meetings a month. Which time time to speak in person. On Tuesday, Judy, what time is town meeting? Seven o'clock, I think. The 15th. Yeah. Is it going to be indoors, Judy? No, it's going to be outdoors. At seven o'clock? Mm hmm. The elementary school. Five fifteen. For me. On which date? Whatever 29th. 29th. June 29th. Mm -hmm. At 5.15. Mm -hmm. So you can have lots of minutes for us to approve before then. Yeah. <laughs> Working on it. Or she's sick of two meetings a month. <laughs> okay, so the last thing we have is the view of town council's suggested changes to proposed Manorana. And do you have that, Judy? Thank you. I'm setting off. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. I, I can read yeah. it. I can't share it. Um, he, we had originally voted that the growing indoor marijuana cultivation 
be defined as the growing of marijuana inside any greenhouse or other fully enclosed structure for the final six weeks of the marijuana plant's growing cycle. And any subsequent drying of these plants in these facilities. He suggests that we remove for the final six weeks of the marijuana plant's growing cycle. Unless you have the email, I don't think you, well, okay. What he suggested is that we strike out, this is, this is what it would wind up being. Okay. After his suggestions, strike out the final six weeks of the growing cycle and change the last wording to marijuana in such a facility. Looks reasonable to me. I don't see any problem with that. Do you feel like it, we've diluted anything? No. No. It's, it's actually, he, he recommended it for clarification. I don't think there's any substantive change. Yep. So Judy, if I could just confirm this, the first part was to strike out final six weeks of the growing cycle. Yeah. The, the last bit. You, sh you should have an email from me that, that has this, but yeah. For okay. the final six weeks of the marijuana plants growing cycle gets stricken out. And yep. then the last five words of the sentence, uh, these plants in these facilities gets changed to marijuana in such a facility. Okay. All right. Um, do we need a motion on this, Judy? Yes. Okay. So move. Move, I will move it. Okay. Thank you. I'll second that. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. Roll call. Brent? I guess that was a yes. Mary? I'm sorry. Tom. Yes. Judy. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Don. Yes. I'm a little punch drunk. Sorry, I was muted again, but it was a yes. We. I did the lip reading, Brent. You're good. That's why you got the big bucks here. <laughs> Yahoo. Um. Anything that any thing that anyone wants to cover under other, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.